I'm Jim Juback. If you're new to my YouTube channel and to me, uh, I've been covering the capital markets for, oh God, 40 years. I've been picking stocks for 25 online. Uh, in 1997, I started picking stocks online for MSN Money. Uh, the portfolio that I started then is still up and running. Um, it's up 584% as of the end of 2019. Uh, since since its inception, uh, you can find uh, that portfolio, other portfolios, my stock picks, comments on the market in general, on my websites. Uh, the free one is jubackpicks.com, uh, and the subscription one, and I hope you'll subscribe, uh, is jubackam.com. And please, besides that, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, and like it. Uh, okay. So what we're talking about today is a series that's ongoing uh, on both of those sites about um, signs of a market top. Uh, you know, we've hit uh, record after record after record. We're starting to get pullbacks in between the records. And the question is whether uh, we're going to get some kind of correction because by all metrics that we've got, uh, this market is overvalued. The problem is there's so many uh, exceptions to those metrics that, you know, we've got a, a Federal Reserve that's keeping interest rates at, at zero, essentially, for uh, as far as the as far as the, the eye can see. Uh, so we've got big cash flows. So we don't know whether any of these metrics are really uh, accurate going forward. So the question of whether this is a market top because things are overvalued is, a, is an important one, but hard to figure out, as well as the chronic question about market tops which is, okay, a market top can look like it's a market top for a long, long time. Uh, and if you get out too early or you go short too early, you get killed. So the question is, looking at this, where are we? What are we trying to figure out? Uh, so far, I've done three parts of this series. I've got at least two more to go. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, so looking for signs of a market top, things like uh, IPO mania, stocks that go up and up and up, and, because, and no one is doing any kind of valuation on this. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, Tesla, which I've got up on the chart right now. Um, and you can see right now we're at 621. The first uh, comment that I've seen recently about what the value of Tesla might be said, oh, okay, so this is an $80 stock. And it's like, it's not so much that I think that necessarily is right, but it's the first time that anyone, in a long time, that anybody's really asked the question. I mean, why ask the question? Look at the way this has just moved. Uh, you can, you've got, uh, you know, where are we, where are we back? We're back here in July and we're at a hundred, we're at 200 bucks. And now we're up at 600. So why would you ask a question about valuation? It's like, who cares what the valuation of the stock is doing, revenue or price to earnings or anything like that. As long as it goes up, hey, super. But you see, we've got this, this long period in between here where people were starting to say, well, you know, gee, maybe I ought to look at something else. What's going on? But then we, hit, we went back to the rocket. Uh, and now, again, unless we're starting to build a kind of plateau here, no one is asking valuation questions. So that's one of the important things, um, uh, sort of zooming stocks with nobody asking about valuations. The other thing is, well, let's see if I can find the chart, uh, a stock called, well, you start to look at IPOs. This is DoorDash, um, which was up 86% on the day of its IPO. You notice that it's had some trouble in between. We went from 174 <laughs> down to, down to, you know, 160. Uh, this is in the course of, this is volatility in the course of five days. So one of the things you get is these huge, huge spikes after an IPO, and then you get a uh, huge, can we call spike, an inverted spike with a, a thrust downward. Um, and that's, a, again, a sign of a market top because no one really wants to stay in very long. So one of the things that was really uh, amazing about DoorDash is that um, at the time of its, IPO, it wound up with a market cap that was greater than the market cap of uh, Kraft Heinz. You've probably got their products in your home. Or Marriott uh, International, you probably stayed at one of their hotels. This is a company, a seven-year-old company that doesn't make any money. It's not profitable. And we're, we can find lots of competitors out there. It wasn't just DoorDash. It was a whole flood of IPOs coming out. 
And so that's one sign of a market cap when, market top, that when you have this kind of IPO activity and everyone's saying, hey, I'll buy it no matter what, um, that's a sign that people are starting, when you, when you get to the end of a market uh, rally, you get uh, this period where you blow out, you have blowout excesses, you call it uh, greed, whatever, and, and these are signs of that. Okay, second thing that I'm, that I'm worried about or that I'm looking at is, well, okay, so this, these valuations are stretched. What might cause valuations to go down? What might price, cause prices to go down? And one of the things I'm looking at is supply. When we talk about the stock market, we tend to talk about demand. We say, oh, okay, so are investors putting their money into the market? Is there demand for stock? And we're seeing huge amounts of demand. But one of the things that's really crazy about 2020 is that for the first time in a decade, actually first time stretching back to the depths of the global financial crisis in 2009, all the way to 2009, 2020 will be the first year when the amount of stock new stock issued by IPOs, companies doing secondary offerings. Uh, you know, Tesla sold $12, million, $12 billion worth of stock this year. The amount of stock sold by companies will equal the amount bought back by companies. This is a, a one for one. Usually it's about three to one. Companies buy back about three times as much stock as they sell, which is a, a constant upward force in the market. Well, there's less stock around, there's less supply. So anybody who wants to buy has to chase fewer shares. And that's why you get a kind of upward bias in the market as long as companies are buying back stock. That's not happening this year. We're getting huge issuance, $510 billion in new stock uh, sold in 2020 by projections if the trends continue. Extraordinary amount of excess supply, uh, not much buybacks because companies are deciding not to because they don't want to buy back at these levels. They don't want to buy back at this price. Um, Tesla's not buying back stock at $700 a share. They're selling more stock. So you got to say, okay, supply is rising. And one of the things that might do is it might gradually, not necessarily cause a crash, but cause prices to, well, you start to look, when you're looking for a market top, at least I do, what I look for is, well, what are the explanations that rationalize prices here? I mean, why are we willing to say that Tesla should sell for this or American Airlines should sell for this? So you look to see what the rationalization is, and then you see whether you can poke holes in the rationalization. Bah, bah, bah. Okay, so here's the rationalization that I hear. When the pandemic is over, there's going to be a huge surge of deferred demand, that people who weren't buying things during the pandemic are suddenly going to start buying things. We've got pent up demand is what it's called. So the idea is that people who didn't go to Disneyland will go to Disneyland. Uh, and in fact, they, people who weren't doing any traveling at all we might, might take more trips. Who didn't buy a car will buy more cars uh, because they put off the decision. So you get a big surge beyond whatever the trend line is in growth and revenue for these companies. So that's that's what people are using to justify stock prices right now. And I got a couple of things to, to say about that. One is that it's not clear to me how much actual pent up demand there is because, you know, one of the things that's happened during the pandemic is that people haven't been making very much money. You get a lot of people out of work, uh, a lot of people working fewer hours. The most recent statistics show that people are starting to draw down on their checking accounts which makes you say, okay, in this environment, do people go out and buy a new car even if they put it off for a couple of years? Uh, well, they put it off for another year. No big deal. Okay, first thing. Second thing is that there are companies which have already seen, if you will, the pent up demand bonus. One of the, the strange things of this and something that I hadn't expected going forward is that people in lockdown or during quarantine uh, have wound up doing a lot of home repair projects, buying new kitchens because they're cooking more at home. So you've had stocks like uh, uh, Home Depot. There's the, there's the pandemic bottom back when we were, when we said it was worst in the spring back in March, and then Zoom. And what's happening here? It's the people who are stuck at home are refurbishing kitchens, putting in new floor. And it's not just Home Depot, you've had exactly the same thing going on in Lowe's. Uh, again, you know, a big, big surge uh, out, of, out of sort of pandemic inspired selling, uh, buying. And so you've got to go, okay, so these companies have already seen their pent up demand bonus, and there are probably other companies in, in the economy where that's true. Second thing, 
Uh, third thing is we need to really look at the possibility that for some companies, there's really no such thing as pent up demand. Okay, you know, people didn't go to McDonald's and buy quarter pounders with cheese during the pandemic because they were afraid to go out or because the restaurant was closed or whatever. Well, that demand for, you know, it may mean that you want to go out and have a cheeseburger soon, but it doesn't mean that you're somehow going to buy all those cheeseburgers in the future that you didn't buy in the past. That demand is not so much pent up, it's simply gone. So you're not going to see, you see, may see tr sales trends go back to where they were before the pandemic, which would be good, although I think it's pretty much priced in, but you're not going to see a big surge uh, in new sales based on the fact that people didn't have old sales. Uh, there are companies where I think you can make a very strong case. This is my, my last caveat here. There are companies where you can make a very strong case that, hey, when we go back, people buy hamburgers. If movie theaters ever open uh, and fast food restaurants start to reopen, we'll sell more Coke. Uh, so those are good trends. But you've also got to look and say, okay, there are companies in this economy where the pandemic has really reset expectations, for example, in airlines. Now, I think when, when, when the pandemic is over and we have vaccines and everybody feels comfortable about flying again, you will see a surge in vacation travel. The problem is that airlines don't make very much money on all those tickets for uh, you and me and Little Junior. They make their money out of business class travel. Business class travel amounts to only 12% of revenue at, at airlines. I find this an incredible number, just 12%. That's 12% of revenue from business travel, but 75% of profits come from business travel. So what happened during the pandemic is the business people stopped traveling, companies cut back on travel. One thing they've discovered is that, hey, well, maybe we, we only need half as much travel, business travel as we did before because Zoom has worked pretty well. So I think you're gonna see a long period where companies are hesitant about spending on business travel and that's really gonna hit the airlines and therefore airlines that are counting on pent up demand, but I don't know that they're gonna see a lot more business suits in those seats uh, and that's gonna have a big effect on their on their revenue. Okay, this is, this is what I've done on, on my series for uh, you know, finding a, mar finding a market top. I've got at least two more pieces to come with that. Um, and they'll b both go up in the next uh, day or two on my internet sites, uh, on jubackpicks.com, uh, jubackam.com. Uh, so you can find that stuff there. Um, and please, again, subscribe to my YouTube channel so I can see you over and over again. You get notice when I'm doing these, probably about once a week. Um, and like us, this is Jim Jubeck. Uh, for Jubeck Asset Management and jubeckpicks.com and jubeckam.com and my YouTube channel. Thanks very much for listening.